Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Teach Climate Network workshop on extreme weather phenomena. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, you probably just heard that I did turn on recording as we have a fair amount of educators that aren't able to join us live, but we'll be watching the recording. But for those able to make it, thanks so much. Um, I'm sure by now most of us are pretty comfortable with Zoom, but um, if you don't mind turning your video on, if you're if you're able, just as we know, it creates a, a little more sense of community as we uh, move forward today. Uh, do keep your yourselves on mute, um, and then you can either turn on or off closed captioning, um, and we'll go ahead and get started. So yeah, today we're going to be talking about exploring extreme weather phenomenon. Uh, this is the first session of our Teach Climate Network workshops, uh, which will go at least through January, probably all the way into March. And I'll talk about our next one at the end of, uh, end of the session today. But uh, my name is Seth Spencer, and I am the Teach Climate Network coordinator for climate generation. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, and I'm coming to you today from Apple Valley, Minnesota, which is the traditional and contemporary home of the Dakota and Anishinaabe people. Uh, climate generation does begin all of our presentations with uh, a land acknowledgement that is a way uh, that people insert an awareness of indigenous presence in land rights and everyday life. Uh, and it can be an explicit way to recognize the history of colonialism and First Nations in our country. So I would really appreciate if you can go ahead and uh, do a quick introduction of yourself in the chat uh, name, if you'd like to throw in your preferred pronouns, uh, where you're coming from today. And if you do know your, uh, the, any indigenous populations that uh, share that land, and I'll go ahead and put uh, a link in to the chat. Um, I will be sharing the uh, presentation with all of you, uh, a link a little bit later, but it is uh, live editing. So I'm gonna wait until we get a little further along in the presentation to do that. But yeah, if you, if you have a chance to go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat, um, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, welcome everybody. And I am hearing a little bit of background noise. Uh, if you haven't already, if you can go ahead and put yourselves on mute. Um, I think I'm seeing everybody now, but um, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. So if this is uh, your first interaction with Climate Generation, thanks so much for joining us. I wanna give a little bit background of Climate Generation's mission and vision, just to give you kind of an idea of, of why we're even uh, talking about extreme weather phenomenon. Uh, in the classroom or uh, really connecting students to understanding the uh, ways that extreme weather phenomenon are related to climate change, uh, as well as possible projects and ways you can look at extreme weather um, and really look at solutions or mitigation efforts. So Climate Generation's vision is to ignite and sustain the ability of educators, youth, and communities to act on the systems that perpetuate the climate crisis. We will accomplish this through three overarching strategies that are guided by Climate Generation's team, which is to overcome science disinformation, uh, center anti-racism and systemic equity, and personalize and localize climate change action. So the first uh, thing I'm going to have you all do, because I do hope that today can be uh, fairly interactive, is I'm going to have you do a, a quick poll. Um, so if you haven't used Slido.com before, all you have to do is go to just type in your browser, Slido.com, 
And then it's going to ask you to punch in that number right there, 588-327. And uh, just asking you to, what does extreme weather mean to you? And I'll give you a couple minutes to go ahead and do that. And I'll put the link in the, in the chat as well. Uh, yeah, and I should ask, uh, is everybody able to see my screen? Okay. Um, I know, Rashmi, you were asking about the number. I'll go ahead and just type it in the chat, but it's 588-327. Perfect. Weather that's outside normal causes extensive damage to the natural or built environments. Intense natural phenomena such as stronger hurricanes, natural disasters, dangerous conditions, danger. more severe weather events, weather that's not standard. Yeah, I'll give folks just about 30 more seconds and then we'll move on. Weather events occurring more frequently that used to be called the 100 year events. And yeah, thank you to whoever wrote that. The, the used to be is really important because uh, we'll talk about that as we go forward too. So just to give you kind of a, a rundown of what we're going to really dive into today is uh, focusing on how changes in climate and weather can impact our land and communities um, that are really uh, looking at extreme weather events. So exploring the connection between extreme weather events and climate change, because um, I think generally we have an assumption that they're, they're linked, but we don't always dive into really how they're linked. And then connect it back to uh, the classroom, whether that's in school or in informal education programs. So what, how do we actually use any of this information? So uh, over the last year, we've had a lot of extreme weather events. Uh, and these can come from uh, things such as extreme rain events. Uh, this is from Western Wisconsin just this past summer to Lake Mead drought, and we can talk about if droughts are really that linked to uh, climate change, but uh, we're at close to historic low levels of Lake Mead, which provides water for uh, a very high percentage of the, the Southwest United States. High temperatures all over the United States, uh, breaking records again and again, and not just in the United States, all across the world. Uh, and of course, Hurricane Ida, that uh, extreme weather in uh, Louisiana, but all the way up the East Coast. Oh, thanks, Marie, for that update. And then what are we expected to have into the future? Um, so if you haven't ever used uh, Climate Central, Climate Central provides some amazing graphics uh, looking at climate change impacts uh, some solutions and mitigation efforts, but um, they, they do predict that uh, there's gonna be a dramatic increase in heavy precipitation events uh, throughout the United States, but especially in the Midwest and the Northeast. And then uh, this one I, I just uh, updated today and I was uh, impressed and uh, kind of shocked of how many times we broke uh, hottest records uh, throughout the US and especially in the, the Pacific Northwest and, and the Midwest. So when we talk about extreme weather events uh, and we used to talk about them as every 100 years, well, over the last 10 to 15 years, we really have seen that these are now maybe decade events of extreme heat, uh, extreme rain. And so we have to think about also how are our students perceiving these things? Is it 
as abnormal as maybe we would have would have seen these events or is this just now their new normal so how do we actually connect students to these extreme weather events if for them it's just kind of the norm uh, and also if you have not ever looked at some of uh, NOAA's uh, pretty amazing data uh, every year they look at um, billion dollar weather and climate disasters and they're really looking at so one uh, one event how has it really impacted the economy and uh, 2020 uh, so just last year broke the record for most billion dollar uh, extreme weather events there were 22 separate uh, and over the last 25 years the average had been seven well we already reached 22 last year, and uh, they have not updated July, but as of July, we are at eight for this year. And uh, I did a, a quick estimate of, of July and August, and we're probably up into the low teens to mid teens already of billion dollar events. And so when we think of extreme weather and how it's related to climate change, uh, I really think it's important to, of course, look at the science of how the, the um, event is happening, uh, because that's generally how we're connecting uh, extreme weather events to climate changes in the science classroom, but also thinking beyond that, uh, really looking at uh, how it's impacting communities uh, and how it's impacting economics as well, because I think that's going to be kind of the driving force of how we push past maybe some of the the political pushback when we're talking about climate change is this is something whether we we as educators probably do want to dive into how it's human cause, but just focusing that these these things that used to be uh, something we'd probably never plan for, we should be planning for on a yearly basis and, and things like tidal surge, uh, extreme flooding, uh, extreme snow events, uh, extreme heat. And so I think that's just a really important thing as, as educators is for us to think about how can we move past just the, the science of these extreme events to really, how do we incorporate it into every uh, subject? Because students are very aware that these things are happening and that they're being impacted by them as well. So it is also very important to talk about the evidence that they're actually connected. Uh, because uh, especially I've, I've seen this this year, uh, more and more news sites have used climate change in talking about extreme weather events, but then there's an immediate pushback that how can science scientists possibly know that Hurricane Ida was uh, impacted by climate change? There's no way they could possibly predict that. Well, uh, sometimes uh, we are very quick to say, okay, here's the link, but some of that science takes quite a bit of time. And so um, there has been a lot of research over the last 15 years by, by NOAA uh, and other science organizations from around the world about how climate change is going to impact these extreme weather events. And so you see that maybe tornadoes and hurricanes, there's not as much evidence that they are specifically caused by climate change. But what we, what we can look at is that uh, increases in temperature and water, uh, so the amount of moisture uh, that's going to be in the atmosphere definitely are connected to climactic changes. And so things like severe droughts, uh, extreme precipitation, coastal flooding, uh, tidal surges, and then heat waves. And these are things that uh, I think when we're working with students are important to at least say, okay, here's where the evidence is really strong. Eh, here's where the evidence still working on, we don't actually know. And so when we look at Hurricane Ida, which uh, I think was um, surprising for a lot of scientists because of how quickly it went from, I believe, a category one all the way up to a four, or even at one point a five, uh, and then moved all the way up into New York and New Jersey and caused extreme uh, flooding events, that's going to possibly be our new norm. And so uh, I think it's at least when we're talking about extreme weather events, really important to, to make those connections uh, very blatant uh, because uh, I think it's pretty easy for, for students to either kind of 
uh, not worry about the connections uh, or not realize how they're actually being impacted. So for the, the rest of our time today, we're gonna really jump into a specific case study of an extreme weather phenomenon uh, and really think about uh, in small groups of how could we actually use this specific case study in our classrooms. Uh, as I mentioned, I am from Minnesota. I'm actually from Duluth, Minnesota, which is right on the tip of Lake Superior. And so this case study is from Duluth and it has to do with Lake Superior. And you might think, well, Seth, you just talked about how it has to do, or extreme weather events and climate change are more uh, drought and tidal surge and extreme flooding. Well, this actually has to do with the level of Lake Superior. Uh, and scientists predict that the level of Lake Superior will uh, change much more quickly year to year than it ever did before because of extreme rain events. And so uh, we're gonna watch a very short video and then we're gonna jump into a case study and you're gonna be working in small groups to kind of think, how do I actually connect this back to the, the classroom or the educators I work with? Canal Park. I'm gonna go get some footage before they probably close this down. Okay, so I want you to kind of remember those images as we jump into this case study and think about how this extreme weather event, which was uh, uh, a large wind and rain event uh, in October, I don't know uh, if you've ever heard the artist Gordon Lightfoot, but he has an amazing song about the uh, gales of Lake Superior that, uh, and this is one of them. And uh, where those people were standing, we're, we're in a parking lot and there's kind of a, a famous uh, lake walk right along the lake that over the last five years has been destroyed uh, four times. And so uh, that's really what we're gonna be looking at is how an extreme weather event uh, impacts the community and how does the community respond to that? Canal Park okay. is currently flooding, right? Okay, so last year, uh, Right at, the, right at the end of uh, 2019, uh, Minnesota Public Radio did a, a really in-depth look at how Lake Superior was impacting the community of Duluth and specifically uh, this very popular tourist spot, um, the Canal Park Lake Walk. And so what I'm going to be doing here in a minute is sharing a link to a news article. I'm going to give you a few minutes to read through that. And then I'm going to be sending you all into breakout rooms. And really, I'll, I'll come back to this uh, slide in just a second. I want you to be thinking about, so what factors could possibly increase these extreme weather events? Because I think it is important for us to at least think about some of those uh, scientific principles and have a basic understanding of how uh, these uh, extreme weather events are uh, either increased or impacted by climate change but really thinking about what are the environmental and social and economic impacts of extreme weather events? And how do I, how do I incorporate this into my classroom? So at first I'm gonna put the link to the article into the chat. And I think everyone should be able to get that. Um, and uh, I'm gonna give everybody about three minutes. So feel free to turn off your video. Um, and we'll come back at about uh, 12, 24 central time. So 24 minutes after the hour, 
Uh, and then at that point, I'll be sending you into breakout rooms of probably three or four people to uh, start talking a little bit about this. So yeah, go ahead and feel free to turn your video off if that's easier for you to read, but I'll stop talking. And I think we had somebody just enter and I'll, I'll just put in uh, the chat uh, a link to an article that we're reading. I'm giving folks about another 30 seconds to kind of wrap up their reading. No worries if you don't finish the whole thing. But uh, then I'm going to be sending folks into breakout rooms for about uh, 15 to 20 minutes. I'll kind of see how we're doing um, to really chat with each other because uh, all of my experience, uh, I can share all of my thoughts and everything, but it's really a chance to talk with other educators about how you would actually use this, whether it's with other teachers or with students to really talk about, okay, we've got extreme weather events. We have looked at evidence that it's being impacted by climate change, but now what, or so what, how do we connect this to the, the classroom and to the curriculum that we already have created? Because uh, while I'll be sharing some great resources at the end, uh, I know that especially once you're in the school year, uh, educators, we don't have time to be uh, trying out a brand new curriculum. So really, how do we connect it to something we're already, already talking about? Um, and we've got one more person that just entered. Um, so I'm gonna recreate our rooms one more time. And then I am gonna be sending everybody to breakout rooms. Uh, and I'm gonna have folks come back. Let's shoot for about 12, uh, 1240 central time, 40 minutes after the hour. And we'll kind of see if I can give you a few more minutes since we've already had a chance to read. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I need to make sure that you all have the link to this PowerPoint. Um, if you'd like, you can take notes. Um, I'll tell you what slide it is here in a second, but here is the link and it should work. Um, yeah, slide 23 is gonna be where you can just put in notes. Um, but generally I wanna think about how do we connect this back to the classroom? Yeah. Uh, any questions either in the chat or unmute yourself before I send people out to breakout rooms? Okay. Uh, when you're in those breakout rooms, please uh, unmute yourself and turn your videos on. And then uh, feel free to either jump back out. Uh, I'll be here if you have any questions. Uh, don't understand what I want you to do, uh, but otherwise I'll see you 40 minutes after the hour. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for uh, sharing some of your thoughts uh, here in the presentation. Because um, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, I know that uh, educators having the chance to share uh, with each other across disciplines, across grade levels, across regions is incredibly important. And uh, you commented on so many things that I, I hadn't uh, talked about yet. And uh, a really a big theme that I'm seeing come out of here is, is making sure that we're connecting it back to the lived experience of students, of what they know is happening within their communities, whether it be phenology, which is an excellent way of tracking that year to year, the birds show up now, but all of a sudden we had an extreme weather event that this is the first year in 20 years, the birds didn't show up the first week of April. Um, but also I'm seeing some great things of, of connecting to uh, the community throughout time. So interviewing folks about the, uh, the extreme weather events or what is maybe the, the new norm. Um, and definitely that, that cultural and regional, um, oh, the, uh, making sure that it's uh, connected back to what people uh, are interested in or do. And so what I mean by that is, in Minnesota, uh, often when we're talking about climactic changes and extreme weather events, we connected back to ice of when either I, well, you got to get your fishing shack off the lake or when is it safe to skate and how not only climate change, but extreme weather events can, can really impact that or that we uh, were having uh, some pretty uh, horrendous conditions for dairy farmers this past summer due to both the, the heat dome that we're having, the drought that we're having, and then uh, the smoke from uh, Canadian and Northern Minnesota wildfires that we're all having. And so I think students uh, can sometimes be focused on what's happening right in their area and kind of not always be aware that, that something might be new or abnormal. And so uh, again, connecting it back to that shared experience of the entire community is really important. 
And one thing that I hadn't yet mentioned, but is incredibly uh, important when talking about climate change and extreme weather events is that it's not equitable. And I think it's really important as educators for us to kind of keep that in mind and also make sure that our students understand it. Um, I think this term of, of climate migrant or climate migration is going to become more and more uh, a normal uh, thing to think about, but that uh, most communities can't do that. They don't have the means. Uh, and so there's, there's uh, lots and lots of research that after hurricanes, predominantly wealthy uh, or uh, sometimes uh, white communities are able to uh, move to other areas that aren't impacted by flooding year after year. Um, but that if you don't have the means, you have to stay and, and deal with it. And, and so uh, both as kind of in education, but also just on the like regional and statewide policy, that is all things that we have to be thinking about moving into how these hundred year events are now decade or even every five year events. So in the, in the 15 minutes that we have left today, I wanna to make sure that we get to a few resources, but also uh, leave some time open for any questions uh, that you all might have. So I wanna make sure that uh, we talk about some resources that are not climate generation because we are not the leader in extreme weather events or talking about the, some of the science behind climate change. And so in that presentation that I shared and I'll, I'll put it in the chat again at the end, uh, in the notes section are all the links to any resources that I share, um, but there's some pretty great ones out there. Of course, National Geographic Education has some great resources on extreme weather events and climate change, um, National Center for Science Education, and one of my personal favorites over the last few months has been this Yale Climate Connections, because they're just, they're really amazing at taking visual data uh, and uh, making it easy to understand what, it, what is happening, um, whether it be with extreme heat or just uh, data over time. And uh, we use them quite a bit. Uh, and if anybody has any question about any of these resources, feel free to open up the, the chat or you can at this point uh, unmute yourself and just uh, shout it out. But of course, I got to make a plug for climate generations, uh, resources, and curriculum. Um, we talk about extreme weather uh, throughout of our curriculum. We don't have a specific module or curriculum that focuses on it. But as you can see, um, all of our curriculum is interdisciplinary, uh, standard supported. Um, most, most have been updated to next generation science standards. A few are really focused on Minnesota specific, but of course, free to download. Um, and then right now we have uh, curriculum from grades three all the way up to 12th grade. As I talked about at the beginning, this is the first of our Teach Climate Network workshops uh, going into the fall and, and uh, winter. And so our next one is going to be Wednesday, October 20th. Um, and Josna Harris, our Director of Special Projects and Partnerships, uh, will be uh, kind of sharing some tips and strategies for talking about climate change and making connections through storytelling. Um, and I'm very excited for this. Josna is amazing at, at this. And uh, she's also the leader of our Talk Climate Institute. Um, and so it will just be a, a great opportunity to kind of think outside of uh, just talking about the science uh, of climate change, but really the importance of, of thinking back to how are students being personally impacted and how do they share that personal impact with that, the outside uh, world. Uh, also, uh, the Teach Climate Network has started to try something a little different this uh, fall. We're gonna be having monthly uh, ask an expert Twitter chats under the hashtag teach climate chat. And so just last week, we connected with two climate scientists from the University of Minnesota to ask about how extreme weather events are connected to climate change in their professional experience. Um, and uh, you can go ahead and go look back through that if you're on Twitter under uh, teach climate chat. And uh, they both did an amazing job of using visual representation of really showing uh, not only that long-term trend, but even this past summer of what was something that was eye-opening to each of them about how maybe our science is a little slow. Uh, we're maybe a little behind of what is actually happening with climactic changes and that we can't 
be uh, stalling. We have to be taking action now. Then, of course, our next one is going to be uh, here on October 14th. Um, and I realize this graphic does not have a date on it, but it is October 14th uh, at noon. And if you have any, if you get any newsletters or anything from uh, Climate Generation, we'll definitely post all of that. But we're going to have two wonderful storytellers from the Clio Institute and uh, Ace Space, um, Reb Anderson and Natalie Rivas, uh, join us on Twitter. Uh, and if you're not able to join live, you can always send me uh, questions that they might be able to answer about how do, how do we make these connections uh, in our communities to uh, folks being personally connected to uh, climate change? And then, of course, uh, if you aren't on our Teach Climate Network, we always recommend that you join because uh, then you don't have to be searching through <laughs> uh, these uh, all the communications to find out about these events. But also, we do share resources on our Teach Climate Network hub. Uh, and you can see that we are now working uh, throughout North America. Um, and so it's just a really great, great opportunity to join a network of educators uh, that uh, really understand the importance of connecting students um, with uh, climate change uh, impact solutions and mitigation efforts. I did, I just saw a question about, is there any information about Talk Climate 2022? So Talk Climate is something that Climate Generation puts on usually in February or March. Um, to uh, really talk about how do we share our climate stories, uh, whether as educators, whether it's in the news media, uh, policymakers. Uh, we don't have any specific dates yet, um, but my guess is that we'll start putting that out in the next month or so. Um, and then, of course, uh, if you're looking to engage with us, um, we've got lots of different ways. Uh, you'll probably see that in the next week or so, we're going to really <laughs> uh, jump into uh, the Conference of Parties or COP26, as we do have an amazing delegation of, of educators and change makers heading to Glasgow at, at this moment. They're heading there uh, right at the end of uh, October for COP26, the first week of November. And then uh, I just put this in there so folks. Uh, that are joining us uh, virtually afterwards can uh, see the Google slide deck. But uh, this is the time that I'm going to go ahead and open it up to questions uh, about anything that we, we chatted about today. And so uh, I want to thank you so much for joining me. Uh, and yeah, if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, turn yourselves off mute or put it in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop sharing my screen. I have one question. Yes. Um, so for the Teach Climate Network, is that more of a um, folks tune in and uh, receive information or is it a networking opportunity for educators? Yeah, that is an excellent question. I will say that at this point, uh, there is uh, an area of our Teach Climate Network hub that educators can communicate with each other, share ideas. It's not utilized very much, uh, and we are going to be transitioning uh, to a new platform in the next few months where I really hope that that is a key thing because we know that educators sharing ideas is, is really important to actually having uh, new concepts that you can use in the classroom. Um, so I would say that you can definitely hop in there and see if folks are communicating, but really these, these workshop opportunities are probably the, the best way um, to get online live and chat with educators, uh, and then also just make some of those connections. But then if there's, if you're looking for uh, connections within your region, um, I'd definitely reach out to me and we can see if we can either set something up or if there's already a network that I know that is already happening. Um, because there's climate generation, we hope that we're a national leader, but we know that in order to localize those impacts and, and solutions, um, there are some great organizations throughout North America that are already doing all of that. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, and I know some folks have to have to head on out, but again, uh, will this recording be available to participants? Yes, thanks, great question. Um, I guess it will be a couple days until I can get that recording um, both on our website, but we'll also send you uh, an email with recording 
all of the links that I shared today, and then some additional resources. Seth, I wanted to um, find out which of those curriculums are really Minnesota based. Yeah, that's so. Don't go through all of them. Um, I mean, I want to. <laughs> It, we luckily make it fairly easy that when you look at our website uh, that has our curriculum resources, it will say Minnesota something on uh -huh. the ones that are Minnesota based. So we have oh. mostly they're Minnesota's changing climate for grades three through eight. And then I think it's grades nine through 12. And Perfect. we have a generally a general changing climate. We have one that really focuses on the, on the changing biomes of Minnesota. So, okay. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, Rashmi, do you, uh, we have a great question about clock hours and I'm wondering if you need anything beyond the hours or do you need a certificate of proof of that? I think just hours. Okay. Uh, you know, that's enough. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Topic and hours. Could okay. Be. Yep. I can definitely yeah. share that. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other questions, everyone? Yeah, well, thanks so much for joining uh, Climate Generation today. And uh, yeah, definitely looking forward to connecting into the future. Oh, yes, thanks, Makala. Uh, I definitely, uh, I know I missed a few uh, things in there, but yeah, if anybody needs any additional links, but that is the link to our, our curriculum page. Awesome, thank you, Seth. Yep, wonderful to connect with you all. Thank you, Seth. Nice to meet you.